Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yep, it's after lunch. There, there was a major in the AG school that said it's after lunch, so I better be brief, brilliant, and gone. Raise your hand. You know who you are. Okay. So, first, uh, it, it's truly a privilege and honor to be here uh, in commemoration of one of uh, the Army's greatest personnelists and leaders. You know, I never worked directly for General Maude. However, I did have the distinct pleasure to observe and interact with him. When he's the aide desperer, I was General Oley's mill assistant when he was the deputy G1. And he is truly an amazing leader and truly a soldier's soldier. Mrs. Maude, thank you uh, for illuminating and continuing the legacy of General Maude. He is truly uh, a shining example of what every, every AG officer, and for that matter, any officer should aspire to. And this here clearly solidifies his legacy. Uh, General Johnson, Pete, good to see you. And your smile is, is broad and wide, and I know exactly why, because you are outside the Pentagon. <laughs> ha how many have served in the Pentagon? Raise your hand. Two tours in the Pentagon, raise your hand. Three tours in the Pentagon, raise your hand. I got you beat. You've been tied. So you know I'm excited. I'm, I'm absolutely ecstatic to be outside the Pentagon and be among soldiers. Major General Goldsmith, thank you for what you do, and thank you for being here, and thank you for your service. Uh, there's some former AG comrades in the audience, Mike Malasso's, Ralph Allison, Kevin Suedo, Al Watley, and I can't forget Sergeant Major Armistead, the standard bearer. Thank you, and it's great seeing you guys are here. Uh, Colonel Neil McIntyre, thank you for your leadership and your wonderful hospitality particularly the leadership of the AG's core, mentoring, education, and learning institution. To my fellow AG officers and enlisted, raise your hands if you're AG. Okay, thank you for what you do. You take care of the Army's most precious resource, and that's its people. Sheriff Lott, Richmond County Police Department, thank you for being here, and thank you for what you do for the community and keeping the community safe and secure. And thank you for your partnership in this endeavor. So today, I was told to talk about three things. Army value as it relates to taking care of soldiers and leader development. Some of my past experiences that have informed my leadership style or my leadership philosophy. And finally, I've been asked to talk a little bit about the future of the force. Forgot you there, Rick. Thank you for what you do for SSI. So my first principle is, is do you have passion for what it is you do or your profession? Raise your hand if you have passion for what it is you're doing. So that's the first thing to it all in my mind, that you love being a soldier. You love what you're doing. Now that we've established that, we can talk about how you knew to embrace the Army values as, an, as you endeavor to take care of soldiers, or should I say people? Because in our business, it's not just taking care of soldiers, it's taking care of civilians, it's taking care of retirees as well, particularly us AG. It's hard for me to believe that anybody who is in the people business as we are in the Army, that you are not passionate about taking care of people or soldiers. So loyalty. Do you lack devotion to your profession? Do you support your leadership? Are you someone who is doing their part to accomplish the mission? Duty. Are you able to accomplish the task as part of a team? Or are you just worried about your assigned task? Do you resist taking shortcuts to undermine the mission? Fulfilling your duty and establishing trust, both internal and external, to your unit is critical to mission accomplishment. Having a sense of duty is critical to mission accomplishment and unit cohesion. Respect. Do you treat people as you want to be treated? Are you stingy with compliments? Do you say thank you? Do you give the salutation of the day? How many of you have supervisors or managers that, that don't say thank you or speak to you when they come in in the morning. Raise your hand. What is that all about? Right? Are you a professional in and out of uniform? 
You have to be careful who you're talking to. I'll give you a short story. I'm in a department store. My wife comes out and she starts telling me, you know, this, this airman just cussed me out with four letter words. I said, oh really? And so I'm, I'm in San Antonio, there's a lot of AIT students. Cussed me out and told me, I'm the, I'm the reason I, I go and fight for you people. I said, oh really? So you know me, I get out, I go in, because I'm, I'm just inquiring because this is a young soldier, so, or a young airman, young troop. So I'm just figuring this person is really uninformed. So I go in, talk to the lady at the cash register. She's in shock. She's saying, yeah, it's exactly like that. And, and it all stemmed from the lady had a lot of, the soldier had a lot of stuff in her hands. My wife said, please, you, you, you go ahead and ahead of me. Don't tell me what to do. I effing fight for you people. So, you know, we go through this cat and mouse. She knows I'm in the store now. She goes to security. And she's standing there with security, and I go to security, and I explain what happened, show my ID card, and he, he steps away, and he goes, you, you, you cussed out the wrong person. <laughs> so, what was I trying to accomplish by finding that person? And the first thing I asked the person is, is that how you should be conducting yourself as a professional? Is that how they teach you to respect people? It had nothing to do with, you know, my wife's a general. But if you're wearing a uniform, a military uniform, you should not be outside of that uniform conducting yourself in public like that because you never know who you're talking about. And you know what? I talked to her and I left it at that. But the last thing I said, I want you to call me Monday after you tell your supervisor and, and tell me what happened. I knew she wouldn't call me. Respect. Selfless service. Do you put the welfare of the Army and your subordinates before your own? Are you serving your country, the Army, and your unit for personal recognition or gain? Are you self-serving? Are you committed and willing to go anywhere the Army needs you to go? Honor. Are you a person of character? Are you respected as a soldier and a leader? Do you display high moral standards? of behavior. Do you take pride in wearing this uniform or are you just putting it on because you have to? Integrity. Do you do what's right legally and morally? Are you a disingenuous person who can't be trusted? Personal courage. Do you stand up for what is right? Can you deal with adversity? Are you willing to make unpopular decisions? So I ask these questions about the seven army values because they're central to everything we do. It's my belief, if you're having problems embracing these values, then something is wrong with your level of passion for your profession. I submit to you that you will have difficulty taking care of people if you don't believe in our values. Inevitably, you'll get it wrong, and the person is going to suffer is the soldier or person you're trying to take care of. Also. You won't be effective as a leader, and you'll take a wrong turn, or your growth will be stunted as a leader. You know, our doctrine states that a leader development is fundamental to our army, it is the deliberate, continuous, sequential, and progressive process founded in army values. This is achieved through lifelong synthesis of knowledge, skills, and experience. You know, based on my 32 years of Army lifelong learning, you know, I'll share some of my key elements of philosophy and leadership style with you that I've learned through the experiences. You always try to maintain self-awareness. I think that's the only way you really can get to self-improvement as a leader, is that you're willing to get that self-awareness through the right kind of mentoring. And so I think sometimes we're confused about what that mentoring is. And sometimes we believe that mentoring is a senior subordinate relationship. It can start there, but I submit to you, I've been mentored by specialists, I've been mentored by captains, I get mentored every day by some brilliant action officers. To me, mentorship is someone's giving you some advice. And if you choose to accept it, then you're being mentored. 
I mentioned earlier, treating people like I want to be treated. I was raised that way. I've never had to come in the office and yell at people, scream at people, and curse at people. Never. I think people will understand when you're serious or when you need to be serious. But there's a way to talk to people. I'm open and approach, Bill. Um, I'm a firm believer that hubris is a climate killer in an organization. Managed by walking around. Ms. Maude and I, she relayed a story about this last night. You don't find out what's going on in your organization if you're sitting behind the desk. Because if you're sitting behind the desk, generally you're going to find out because someone's going to tell you. You should have a trusted advisor, and that's normally your, the senior non-com or senior NCO, the command sergeant major, or an NCO in the organization. Because in my, my, my experience, that's the person that's closest to the climate of the organization. But you've got to get around and talk to people. I think managing by walking around, you really understand how you manage the talents of your organization. And you can put your best people on, on your most complex problems. Decentralized action, I love to power down, but I monitor the suspenses. The MDMP process, how many of you have heard of that? That's critical. I found that critical at the tactical, I found that critical to operational, I particularly find it critical in the Pentagon. Because in the Pentagon, I don't make a decision. We just tee up the decisions. We provide best military advice. And sometimes it's even more complex because in that building, that's where you find the Constitution really being exercised and Title X really being exercised because of civilian oversight we have. There's not a lot of people making decisions that are wearing this in the Pentagon. And so the only way you can get to decisions, there's some other strategic acumen you need, you have to tee up best military advice. And I've found no better way than correlating and analyzing the information that'll lead you to some kind of closer action. And generally, it's up to that leadership to underwrite or mitigate the risk. But you've got to identify it. You know, Pete knows we can go, we've gone to meetings, and there are brilliant people in the meetings, and they already have the answer. They already have the answer to the solution. But I submit to you, use that process. Because you'll find out in many venues, there are smart people that can quote a reg to you, and you go back, and, it, and it, you know, it's not exactly that way. So based on my observation, you know, leading people is a privilege, not a right. People are central to everything we do, and we should take care of them that way. Maintain self-awareness through meaningful mentorship before it's too late. Vision. The Army wants leaders who have vision. Know what needs to happen and make it happen. Establish goals and objectives and metrics and measure that progress. We want people who can develop priorities and understand the priorities. You'd be surprised in, in a strategic setting as ours how priorities can get misconstrued and you can get people working on something that may not be a priority. General Milley's made it pretty, pretty easy for us in terms of priority. There's no other number one priority and that's readiness. So everything we do, we see that through the lens of readiness. Reputation and credibility. I talked about this with the the uh, Captain Career course yesterday. I talk about this at the PCCs with the AG field grades because what you don't realize is once you get to field grade, your credibility and your craft and how well you know your craft and your reputation as a leader and how well you can manage complex organization and lead change is out there because now you're working for senior leaders and that circulates quick. So. You know, it, it's, it's imperative that you, if you're credible and you're in that forum, that you're talking with credibility. You're not just talking to be heard. You know what you're talking about because sometimes it's just better not to say anything, isn't it? And if you're a leader of organization, is that you have the right climate and right environment at organization because I've seen plenty of people who can get it done and it looks good on paper and they self-destruct. 
because of their own hubris, because they fail to maintain the environment and climate that's central to taking care of their own people. You know, I'll share with you a few experiences. My first experience, and, and so, you know, I talked earlier, it's not necessarily in the Army how you start, it's how you finish. So, you know, the Army, the AG Corps, thought it would be nice, you know, to send Second Lieutenant Jason Evans to Pine Bluff Arsenal, Arkansas for his first duty assignment. So I go to Pine Bluff, and it's, it's clearly a, a, a Captain KD job or branch qualified job. So I'm already punching up. And so three, three months inside of that, you know, I'm, I'm working for my Raiders in 05, and my senior Raider is a colonel, which is, you know, brigade level, you know, S1. And so, you know, I'm the installation adjutant. I've got MWR, 13,000 acres of hunting and fishing. I've got the community club. I've got the Army Community Service, records manage, audiovisual, installation post offs, Army Emergency Relief, casualty notification, and casualty assistance for about a 50 mile radius plus in Arkansas, because we're the only active duty installation in Arkansas. And ID cards, hand receipt holder, you know, fairly complex, I think, for a second lieutenant. And so you think you come in, and the first person, you know, my dad tells me is find the senior NCO because he's going to teach you what you need to know. Don't worry about it, son. It's going to be all right. Well, that's not what happened because that guy was a rod, retired on active duty. You know, by the end of that, by almost by the time he's retiring as a second lieutenant, I was doing the DA-6 for the casual notification and casual assistance officers on that installation because it was so jacked up. And so I, the person I found as a trusted advisor was a lady by Pat McClure, old enough to be my mother, but she was committed to the Army values, had integrity, had all that, and she was, you know, co committed to making sure that I knew what I needed to know because the NCO was watching me trip up. So anyway, and, I, and you know, so I had the recreation, and three months inside of this, the IG's coming. You know, I'm a second lieutenant, IG's coming. Okay, great. So, you know, the installation commander says, are we straight? You got that straight? I go down and tell everybody, you got that straight? You got that straight? Yep. So we're sitting in the outbrief, and that's not straight. And he looks at me and says, well, I thought you told me it was straight. And it wasn't. There was, there was in terms of recreational property, the accountability was terrible. Security was terrible. You know, I didn't go out and check the checker. But, you know, I learned a very valuable lesson in, in all of that. One was understanding my boss's priorities. The other thing was that I learned early on was accountability and how to hold people accountable. Because you know, after that, the 03 Charlie, which back then was a recreation NCO, we had a counseling session. And, and then I dug deeper only to find out that the non-appropriated funds were being used by his supervisor, who was a GS-12, buying cleaning supplies wholesale that weren't ending up in the recreation center or anywhere on that installation and had to terminate him. But the business about accountability is, is sitting someone down and formally counseling them so they understand the priorities and the mission and putting that in writing. And I was glad that I learned that early on because I've continued that in terms of accountability because I've watched people get to, the, to almost you know, field grades before they start counseling people, particularly with civilians because you're not going to treat a civilian like you treat soldiers. You are going to sit down and you do need to lay out the goals and an individual development plan or else you've lost because they have an abundance amount of, of due process and recourse when you decide you want to take some kind of action. But it was not just accountability for bad, it was accountability for good and empowering people. I learned a little about self-awareness in terms of, you know, under, operating under duress. Can't feel sorry for yourself. I said it was straight, so I had to take responsibility for it. But I became aggressive. People became important about motivating them. I learned that hand receipts were important. The, the one thing that, that was good is, is I didn't sign for that hand receipt, but I ended up being responsible, you know, taking six months to straighten it out because the guy who was responsible for it left, and it was not good. 
So, you know, that was his first example of leading an organization and punching above your weight. You know, the second one, I would say, was uh, going to G1, you know, 13 Coscom. It's funny how it happened, and I reflect on it because at that time, I'm a captain. The G1 of the 13 Coscom is an 05, and so we're, we're going to go in the first, you know, the first forces that go into the Somalia. And, you know, we're probably about 30 days out. And he goes, and, and he's gone. He's, he's got a job down at 2ID, he's G1. So people disappear. So uh, the, the G1 that was supposed to come ended up becoming non-deployable. So I'm going as a captain. And the G1, the Joint Task Force, Somalia in an 05 position. And so, you know, I'm going to be the principal advisor to General Solomon as a, as a CG for that. And again, you learn how to persevere under duress, particularly in that environment because it was an immature theater. We didn't have the IT, we didn't have this, we didn't have that. And, you know, he gave me the business. You know, he, he did not, you know, it did not matter that I was a captain in an 05 position. There were times when I'm briefing and he'd say, sit down, that's wrong. And that's, that's the morning, morning update. But, you know, he could have easily fired me, but that didn't happen. You know, he persevered. And again, it's, you know, you come out of there about self-awareness, you know, about selfless service, about courage, and about really, again, it's about the people. You learn about leading and integrating across staffs because I had to interact with the JTF, you know, headquarters and CENTCOM and RCENT. At that point, you're learning how to deal and run and lead complex organizations in complex environment. And so I, you know, I think the last one is my time in the Pentagon. And so you, you know, I learned something very important about the Pentagon, and, and Pete can validate this, is how you get to decisions in that Pentagon. And people laugh about the two-hour meetings, but it's really about relationships matter in that Pentagon. You have to engage and have the conversation with all the key stakeholders. You have to get consensus. And sometimes you have to make concessions because you're not going to get everything you want. And so it's important that at the strategic level that you understand that you have to nourish those relationships. And see, on my third time back, it's much easier to operate because I'm now able to network with a lot of the relationships that, are, that have been there because the civilians, you know, in a lot of cases, they don't go anywhere. But that's the same person that when you come in and out that you're going to need to have the conversation with. You know, from these three examples, I learned how to operate at the tactical, the operational strategic levels of the Army, where people are central to the success of failure and be able to maintain awareness, self-awareness to ensure self-improvement. And every day I learn something from the great soldiers in the DMPM. And so my question to you is, do you lead with the Ar these Army values in mind in everything you do each day? Are people and soldiers central to everything you do, and are you taking care of them? And are you a leader that maintains self-awareness to ensure self-improvement? Now, I was asked to talk a little bit about the future of the Army and where we're at. So since I told you that readiness is the number one priority, our, our number one issue with regard to that in the personnel community is the non-deployables. And as a total army, we've got 148,000 soldiers that are non-deployable. And 91% of those are due to medical. And what we need is we got to get the soldiers on the field so they can play their position. You know, we've done, we've we got to do our part at the department level and not put out policy that is restrictive 
or doesn't allow commanders the flexibility to make determinations of deployability and non-deployability. We've, we've endeavored to do that. We have to make sure that the email PO and DERS-A systems or whatever systems you use are interoperable. And as a total force, we all have to be on the same system. We're working towards that. The active component is 60,000 non-deployable, and still about 90,000 of those are medical. So to the degree that you can help with that, that's exactly where we need to help right now, because we are going to go to 450 in the active component and a total force 980 from as high as 1.3 million. We're going to go to that. We're going to continue to have drawdown boards, at least to FY19. So the promotion rates you're seeing now, you're probably going to continue to see the promotion rates at that level. The enlisted uh, recruiting challenge. We're all soldiers for life. We need your help with that. We had a recruiting a sessions mission of 62,500. I'm confident we're going to make that this year. But the problem we fundamentally have is if we contact 16 million and we have a mission of 62,500 and we get to the, through the first unit of assignment and we only have 40, 45, 43,000, what's wrong with this picture? You know, the cumulative attrition across that that accession's enterprise is about 36%. It's down some, but we've got to get it, we've got to get it right. We've got to recruit people of character, people who can physically, I mean, the Army, you know, really, the Army and the Marines are the two services. It's, it's a physical game. You know, the Marines, uh, you know, they've attacked the problem in their depth, the delayed entry program, where they have people waiting a year. They start training them physically, so we're looking at that kind of stuff. But what we need you to do is inform the American public exactly how honorable it is to be a soldier. What we do here is a cause bigger than, than ourselves, because we need the quality soldiers to come here. Number one reason why people are treated is misconduct. Then you got musculoskeletal injuries, and then you got those who can't make the height and weight and those who just can't do the PT. So we need your help with that. Uh, good news, uh, you all have heard about the gender integration of integrating women into combat roles. Right now, we're probably about 200 that we've assessed, that contracted, or rebranched in you know, infantry armor or fire support specialists. We're going to have probably about 140 sometime in the fall start infantry and armor. It's a good news story. We're a standards-based army, and if you can meet the standard, then you should be able to perform that job. Army, Tal Man Army Talent Management Task Force. I don't know if any of you remember OPS 21 when General Oley took a look and we created OPS 21. Major General Al Schaffner is, is doing that effort right now, taking a holistic look at the Army's talent management. We've already made some strides in terms of who, who's, who has set a, a board, right? So you look through 13 pages of the MOI, right? So we're trying to get, you know, when I was the chief of DA secretary, it was really only three or four pages. So we're trying to take a look at that, trying to get senior leader, maybe the, maybe the chief get a video so he can convey to the board what's, what's key and what's important. So that task force in the end will help us manage that talent. Broadening. I mean, we've all heard about broadening. What, what really constitutes a broadening assignment? putting more definition on that. So again, it's been my privilege and my honor to be here with all of you today um, on behalf of uh, General Maude, again, a great leader and probably the greatest personnelist that the Army has known, Army Strong. I got a gift for you. Uh oh. I'm going to, on behalf of the Maud Foundation, I'm going to thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank Appreciate you for it. your work. Absolutely. Do you have time for QA or? Oh, sure. Sure. I always leave time for Q&A. I think I came in under 30 minutes. What are your questions? 
Okay, so it goes like this. I won't leave until I get three. Back there in the back, stand up. Who's that? Is my mic hot? Sir? Yes. Great question. Great question. So here, here's what I tell you about that. If say won't fail. So part of the steps to that is, is I think we have, we've been much more meticulous about how we develop the concept of operations. I've seen demo of it. Um, we've invested the right talent on the problem. The XORD is out, which is more than what we've seen before. So I can tell you from that perspective that uh, I think um, FY18, and, you know, around the corner before we have to start doing something. So I think the effort of investing the right people, making sure that we've invested the resources wisely, and we have a system that we've been able to, we've done some demo of that already on the soldier record brief. I don't know if you've seen any of that. So that is, that's as much farther than we got before. I think the key thing for us is, is why, why do we as an army you know, we, we talk about total army, uh, you know, I, I don't, really don't like that we're total army, but that, that's a policy. We're all in the army, right? Compa one, two, three. But you know, we all have three different or different personnel systems of record. IPSA is gonna give us one system where we're all on it. It's gonna give us one system where we can better manage talent and permanent you know, I don't know if anybody in here has gone from Title 10 to Title 32 and back and forth. Who's done that? It, is it an easy process? Sucks, doesn't it? In some cases, it, it affects your pay, doesn't it? Well, the idea with IPSA is that eliminate that. So that, I don't know if that answers your question, but having seen some of the demo, I'm confident that it is not dimers. Next question. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Sir, Sergeant Cottrell with ALC, Class 007 Alpha. My question is, um, with the new promotion system in effect, um, what are the positives for the AG and DO board? You mean step? Is that what yes. you mean? Yes, sir. Oh, well, so, so here's one thing I think is positive is that, you know, before we promote you, you're actually qualified to, you know, you're serving in the rank. We, I, I think fundamentally, if, if you haven't had the, the appropriate per military, professional military education, I know before we did that, you know, we were in two wars and some of that was op tempo. I think fundamentally, you know, you're missing, you know, a, a key thing in your development as a leader if you don't get the, the professional military education. So I think that's one thing. It's a forcing mechanism to make you go do the SSD and go to the right schools before you get promoted. Now, I understand there, there may be some exceptions, but I, I gotta tell you, I've looked at the decentralized promotions and, and we've counted some numbers about six, 600 soldiers that we think should be appearing before promotion boards. So I, you know, I, I put it back to you guys, what are we doing to get those young soldiers, first sergeants, command sergeant majors, in front of the promotion boards because by our count there's about 600 that should be getting promoted or be before promotion boards but i think you know we had to do step as a forcing mechanism to make sure that we're developing leaders the right way answer your question yes sir No, we're on track. We're on track. We're at, we're four, we're, uh, the goal was to be at 475 by this end of the fiscal year. Next fiscal year, goal is to be at 460. And then by FY18, 450. Um, we, we've been very thoughtful and meticulous about the playing of the drawdown boards. You know, I was, uh, who was around for the first drawdown in the early 90s where we tried to do 100,000 people in a year 
we, we, were, we were not mindful of the talent we needed to retain. The, the drawdown boards this time, we're retaining the talent we need to retain. Um, so every month, you know, we have what we call uh, as a pub, which is really a review of where we're at on the numbers. We have horses on it, checking the behavior of, of the force, which is loss rate, involuntary, involuntary. So I'm confident, you know, that, you know, by FY18, we'll be where we need to be. Yes, sir. So I'll just answer this from a macro view. So for both officer and enlisted. So part of the drawdown is, is make sure you don't have promotion stagnation. Make sure you promote the health, you protect the health of that branch or that MOS. So we control the requirement. So we can adjust the requirement. We can put in a floor to make sure that someone gets selected. We can put in a ceiling to make sure that you select to that. Um, in terms of the AG core, I, I think we're good. Um, I, I think the, the only downside to all this is the promotion rates. We, you know, I'd like to see them try to get them back to where we were, but you know, with, with a downsize, it, you know, you really can't do that. But we do pr protect the MOS. We still do QMP for, you know, for every uh, enlisted centralized promotion board. So that's one way. The, the thing that we haven't had to do. Uh, last year was a QSP. That's a tough one for the enlisted because that, that's you know, less about the quality of file and more about we've got to get to a number. The QMP is you've got something in your file and that board looks at it, then you can be considered for separation where a QSP you know, is, is a little, little more difficult to do. With the officers, you know, drawdown, um, we're looking at legislation, um, looking at policy where, where we can consider all captains in the same group because you have some Title X because of the years of commission, you can't be considered. You have to have an E-serve or serve. We also want to make sure that, you know, if, you, if you're close, that you can, we, we can retire you or give you, you know, get the temporary retirement authority, TARA, so you, you leave and, and we treat everybody with dignity and respect. It's, it's tough business, but I think we're on, we're, on, we're on the mark. We watch the numbers all the time for that. Yes, sir. Then I'll come to you. Yeah, you. Standing up. You. Sir, this is Lieutenant Dale Wilder. Yeah. Uh, AG Bowler, Class 307. Yep. Uh, with development of the Army Talent Management uh, Task Force, uh, yeah. are there any personnel initiatives being discussed uh, that could potentially uh, affect our future? Yes. It, all of them. So they're taking a holistic look at um, how we manage warrant officers, how we manage captains, how we manage the, you know, the, the graduate program and the number of graduate programs and the number of people we send to graduate schools. And let me give you an example. So you know, in any year, we may send you know, anywhere between 400 to 500 officers to graduate, fully funded graduate school programs. And then the officer comes and may not get selected. Is, is that what you want to in, invest in? No, we need to, we need to make sure that it's, it's performance based and that we're managing the talent of those folks going to those grad programs, right? The, the other thing we're taking a look at is, is the up and out. Can we get some flexibility with that? If you send an officer to uh, Oxford, right? And, they're, and the most they've done is bowl it, and then they got to go before the captain's board. How much paper do they have in their file? How many evaluations do they have in their file to be competitive with their peers? Zero. But we've invested in that, and the way the system is now, they probably could become a non-select. So part of the talent management task force will look at, you know, do we have an option for that officer to defer that promotion so they can get through, you know, particularly if you're an infantryman. I think you'll agree an infantryman who goes a bullet probably should go to airborne school and go to ranger school, right? 
And so we want to allow him to finish that PME, get to the first unit of assignment, probably get some evaluations in the record if we can, if we can get it deferred. So though that's some of what's being looked at. Um, looking at how do you incentivize aviators. They always have an incentive, incentivization program, but are, are we incentivizing them correctly? Instead of just incentivizing everybody, are we incentivizing those that need to be incentivized? Uh, if say, it, you know, is key to that. We want all the information about an officer we can get about the skills that they have, where's Mr. Smith, and their behaviors. Not in a bad sense, but in a good sense. Because some people, particularly um, in the, you know, the Reserve Component Army National Guard, they have a profession outside of the Army that may be very germane to, to, some, to some skill set we need in the Army. And you may not know that. We may not know that. I think that, you know, if say will help us with that. So those are the kinds of things it, that uh, the Talent Management Task Force is looking at. Answer your question? Yo, go ahead, you and then, then you. Go ahead. I don't know. That's a good question. Hey, I'm, I'm not a sustainer brigade commander, but you know, I, that's a good question. Um, I, I guess really, you know, keeping up with the, the demand of the warfighter. Uh, you know, that's I'd be that guess be that best question. I mean, do we have a sustainer brigade commander in here? Battalion commander. Yeah, I, I you know, so I don't get I don't get much feedback from sustainment brigade commanders in that regard. I, I do get some feedback about what AG folks are doing or not doing. So yeah, so I don't have a better answer for you. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Yeah. What effect will the drawdown have? Um, so we, we've had a, I'll just give you my, my, my view on it. So it, I think it's more about what are we doing now as an Army versus what were we doing? We previously were, were deployed in, in a couple theaters, in, you know, division type, brigade type. We're primarily a garrison Army right now. As a result of drawdown and resource constraints, you know, we, we do have some reductions in the MPD. So in the military personnel division on the installations, they do a lot of the ID cards and reassignment, those kinds of things. We, we've experienced some cuts there. And because we're primarily a garrison army, um, is the SRC-12 structure, the structure that goes out and supports, is that right? What I'll say to this is, I think it's time for us to look at that. And are we structured right to assist with an installation mission that takes care of the soldiers, families, and retirees, and also support you know, the warfighters? And you know, in that, um, Division G1s and, and Core G1s took a significant reduction. And if we think that the Division G1 is the center of gravity for, for personnel operations, do they have the capability in terms of people? And so I would tell you, um, I don't think so. And I would tell you, I think, um, because of where we're at, we need to relook that. I don't know what that looks like, but I'm willing to tell you, I think some MDMP will, will, will tell us. And I've been around you know, for a long time to see how that works in a garrison environment, how we organize, how we task organize to support the sustainers in, in, the, in, the, in our fighting formations. So you know, I have a thought about it. But I will t answer your question, yes, we, we, need to, we need to look at that. Uh, 
part two, uh, specifically what changes are being made to any coverage or policy policies? Uh, they're not all good. I mean, the, the, the most recent one that I, I've, I've experienced is, you know, rolling, rolling down of the, the grade of the NCIC for the battalion and brigade S1 shop and taking other reductions out of, you know, the S1 shop. I think what you have to understand is, you know, we, we're right now, we're an army. We, we've got our, our requirements really, you know, are much uh, more in demand than our distributable inventory. You know, we, we did some modeling at 450 and, and 30 BCTs. Um, that we would, with the current demand on the structure, we overstructured, you know, we'd probably be minus about 29,000 29, people for distributable inventory. That's considering about a 10% non-deployable rate and a 13% of those people in the TTHS account. Now, the non-deployable rate is 15% right now because we've added Mark Ford back in there, but um, that's what I know. I know that there's some restructuring uh, initiatives you know, with our combat formations for the better uh, to try to build a capability. But in a resource constrained environment, whenever you're trying to build capability, there's a bill payer. Because, you know, we have, you know, a cap on the resources because the lawmakers, you know, haven't given us any more money than what we have now, there, there has to be a trade space. And so senior leaders have to weigh the risk of that. So that, that's one change that, that I've seen um, that I, but I think we've been able to push back on that because I think the last thing you need at the battalion level is to roll down that grade of an NCO, the NCOIC, to maybe a, a staff sergeant and an E5 shows up because we know how this business works, right? You, then, then that battalion S1, I think, may be in peril because you may be in a situation where both people are learning instead of the NCO teaching the lieutenant what needs to happen and I can tell you right now brigade commanders or battalion commanders don't have time to do our job yes, sir. Uh, the last part of that uh, is that other equipment a couple of years now is that going to some type of uh, kind of hybrid DSP structure mm -hmm. like uh, or you can just go back to the company yeah type of thing. Just a burn unit, you know, I don't know what you're talking about I think you just heard me say in your first question that we need to do an assessment. I think uh, uh, Colonel Neil McIntyre and his group are doing a great job at, at doing that assessment. Um, and I think um, they're taking a look at, at that. I, I can't confirm or deny any of that because, again, I haven't seen the MDMP. Okay. All I know is we, got to, we have to look at it. All right, I'm getting the hook. Again, thank you for what you do and appreciate you being here. Army Strong.